Hi everyone, this is Simma Lieberman, the inclusionist with Everyday Conversations on Race for Everyday People, where we bring people together across race to have conversations on race. I am so excited to about my next two guests, Amy and Hardy Nickerson, Nickerson. And Amy was on my show before. I loved having her on the show. A lot of people love hearing Amy. So I'm gonna have, so Amy and Hardy, would you each introduce yourself? Okay. Hi there, everybody. I'm Amy Nickerson. I uh, was one of Simma's guests in August, I believe, talking about the book, How to See Us, uh, which details lots of police issues with our family. And uh, I'm happy to be back to talk some more. Unfortunately, we still have to have a lot of these talks. And hi, everybody. I'm Hardy Nickerson. Um, let's see here. Um, I'm Amy's husband and uh, uh, helped a lot with, uh, with uh, a lot of the stories that Amy has in her book, How Do You See Us? And uh, I'm excited to be on the show today. Well, thank you so much. I mean, of course, we are going to talk about the verdict. We're talking about what's going on in this country around race. But one of the reasons why I wanted to have Hardy on with you, because as, as a Black family, you know what it's like to be continuously stopped, continuously policed by white people. And with the recent killing of a young black man, it was it in what state? What, what state was it in that he was just that he he was stopped by the police? He called his mother. Yeah, Minnesota. 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 Oh, of course. Oh, of course, Minnesota. That's right. Right out of Minneapolis. And and I thought about your story. And stories, and I'm wondering if you know if you could just share a couple of those stories. And Hardy, if you, you too, if you could talk about what it's what it's like as a family to have to deal with that, and also to have your son stopped like that. Yeah, um, it's it's uh, it, it's 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 frightening. Um, we we've had one of our experiences. We we were traveling with the whole family. Um, we we're going on a spring break trip uh where we were in in the state of florida and we were driving uh to uh uh panama beach or panama city um and we were we were stopped and the cop has his gun drawn um and immediately i, I as i'm pulling over as soon as i stop i let all the windows down because i had three babies sitting in the back seat and amy and i of course in front seat and I'm looking at my rearview mirror, and as, as he gets out of his car, he, he draws a gun right away, and um, walks up to the car, and you know he's he's in he's in, um, you know I don't I don't know he was in full um you know there's something that could go down here, that kind of mode, and peeking in peeking in the back back seat of the car, then up to the front of the car, then all the questioning and, and, and everything. And, and I've got my hands on the steering wheel with my driver's license in my, in my hold it in, in between my fingers, got my registration sitting up on the dashboard. Amy's got everything all, all ready. So if you ask for something, he can see it plain and we can reach for it in plain, uh, plain sight. So, uh, it, it, you know, that, that was pretty, pretty frightening, pretty eye opening. Um, it's like, man, do we look like criminals? We're not in the car. We're not in the car with, you know, that would look, you know, I could see if, if you could see in a car, you might be on alert. Um, you know, and I have some friends that are, that are in law enforcement that, um, that, uh, you know, have explained how, you know, how the adrenaline gets flowing when, uh, when you make that traffic stop. But you know, we we did everything we did everything that you you can do to try to de-escalate the situation, and you know, uh, uh, luckily, you know, we we left that situation without anything happening, other than getting a ticket that I didn't think I deserved. <laughs> uh, but uh, but that was pretty frightening. And that fear, that fear, and for your kids. Yeah. Right. I, I'll Absolutely. chime in on that because, you know, in the book, I, I talk about our son, Hardy Jr., who, you know, is just always, there's just this thing about black boys, black men, you know, um, women too, of course, but 
there's really something about black males that is supposed to be so frightening and threatening. And we, we've run into that, you know, it starts, it starts early. It, it happens at school. I'm writing about that, about school encounters too, because they're the ones who get labeled aggressive when the white boy who does the same thing isn't, oh, he's just a boy, but the black boy. So, you know, you've got these mental uh, compartments that were placed in, I think, in many white people's minds about what they think we're gonna do, what they think we're capable of or, or not. And so that whole thing about being stopped and being a, a you know, young black male frightened me all the time. When, I, when my son, I, and I think I, I told you this before, Sima, I, I can't remember what I said on the last show, but- Say it again. One time, my son was in, uh, he was in Cincinnati and, and my son is an NFL player. So he, he took after his dad and that should matter one way or another, but I was just saying it because that's where he was and why he was in that city. And he was driving his car that had California plates. And we were on the phone talking about race, talking about all kinds of stuff and neighborhoods. And lo and behold, he tells me, oh, I'm being stopped. Like, wait, what? Are you kidding me? Like, we're, it's so ironic because we were just talking about race and neighborhoods and police. And so I said, well, you let me stay on the phone. Okay, don't, don't let me, I want to hear because that's what a mother's inclination is. Long story short, because it would take too much time to go over everything. The cop comes over and he starts, I can hear, I can hear everything through the Bluetooth uh, thing. You know, Hardy had me on there. And the guy was just kind of like, sounding anal to me, you know, about, you know, let me see your, you know, is this your car? We always get, is this your car question. It was a Mercedes SUV. And I think that some people don't think we should be in those. And so that that's their alert, like, is it stolen? Is it? Why are you in this? So then he kept asking about the California plates. Now everything was up to speed, you know, registered, everything was good, but he didn't like that he was there from California. Now, I don't know what dude was thinking. I don't know if he was thinking, is he running drugs? Is he, but whatever he thought, it wasn't the best of him. And he kept asking, you know, what, let me see this. And why are you here again? Well, long story short, my son would never, he would tell him that he was, he was in town because he worked in town and that's true. He never did, though, say, I'm a Cincinnati Bengal. I didn't know why my son didn't do it, because I felt like, hey, tell him why you are here and why the car's out. Of but he didn't do it. But, but the police response was just crazy what I was hearing. And so I blurted out, and I never should have done it because he told me to be quiet. Hardy, tell him about the Bengals. And he hung up on me. OK, he hung up, and I was then frightened because I've got imaginations going about, Lord, what's he about to do to my boy? And I can't be the lifeline. Cause you know, now, as you know, and what was pivotal in this Minnesota case is that somebody did capture what happened or else who knows, George Floyd might've been just another dead body. But long story short, he ended up being okay. The dude was just b bothering him. He wasn't speeding, wasn't doing anything. It just seemed to be that he was trying to see what he was doing there. Um, he did give him a ticket though, but Hardy said he hadn't been speeding. Um, I later found out asking Hardy why he hung up on me like that. Apparently his team at the time, they had instructed the players not to ever tell if they were stopped, to tell that they were Cincinnati Bengals, some kind of PR reasoning. Oh. As a mother, I'm saying, you're doing your black players a disservice if they cannot tell somebody who's hassling them why they're in town and explain why they might have a car that's from my, even though, and beyond that though, Sima, isn't this America? Can't we have a car from out of state going through, you know what I'm saying? So many things that we must contend with as black people when whites are suspicious, whether it's the police or the lady who just wants to, to call the police. And, and it's frightening, it's, it's draining, okay? It, I, well, I stay, I, I think I have PTSD from all of it. And so, you know, mental, uh, your mental uh, just levels of stress are high. And I never know. Now, you know, now he's in a new state and, and, and I'm still a mother and I'm, I, he's, for all I know, I think he's fine, but you don't know what people will do. And it seems to me that black men and black women too 
are not given benefit of the doubt when there's some kind of question about your place. Why are you here? Are you supposed to be here? Uh, hmm, something seems weird. I don't know if you should be. Yeah, you know, we continue to play that reel over and over again, you know? And, and it's, just, it's just heartbreaking because that's not freedom, Sima. And my son told me that. He said, you know, you know, this is when I was hounding him about his hoodie and he, he should be able to wear a hoodie if it's comfortable to his head and warm like white boys can do. Yeah. But when he does put it on, it brings about a whole new world of suspicion possibilities. That's not fair at all, but that's what's been constructed. And he told me, you know, I, I, don't, I don't feel free. And he's not free if we got to go down this checklist and keep doing all this check, check. Okay, you got this? Yep, check, Roger. Yeah, hard. Hey, call me when you get there. This is like 1940 or 50 driving through Deep South following Green Book to make sure you're not killed. But that's what it feels like all over the US. Hardy, what are your thoughts too? I mean, as a black man and, and as a father. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's just dis disheartening um, because, you know, the, the, and, and what you see, what, you, what, we, what we're seeing on video now has been, has been happening for the longest time and uh, most recently being Dante Wright um, and then the young lady who was, who was shot uh, just a few days ago. Oh, and someone else was just she shot died. also. Wait, like yesterday. Columbus? Yeah. Uh, South Carolina, I think somebody else was just, okay. uh, 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 unarmed, black, uh, yeah. unarmed black man was just killed. Oh no. Again. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, it's just, Oh man, it's just uh, uh, it, it's just disheartening when you, when you see it all, and you and you you really it's really tough. Um, you know, shoot, when when Amy was was when our son was was being pulled over, and then um, uh, they got disconnected. She called me right away, and and uh, and uh, you know, I was at, at work at the time, and I'm like, oh man, shoot, worried about you know, and then trying to call him. So I think we were all trying to call him. <laughs> while he's uh, right, right in the middle of the situation. And, and when you can't get a hold of your loved one and this is, ha and this is uh, a situation like this is occurring, it, man, it's, it is, it is nerve wracking to say the least. You know, and then you have like, then you have like white people who will say, well, if he would just be polite, if he would just wear a suit, if he would just, drive a nice car, but then they're like, uh, what right do you have to drive that car? I'm, you know, yeah. I can't drive that car and I'm white. Why should you be driving that car? I'm going to put you, and you know, to me, I always say this, it always goes back to me to the Dred Scott decision, you know, uh, um, you know, there's black men or black people now have like no rights that white people are bound to respect. And I, I think it still goes back to that ownership mentality. And I don't know what that's like, you know, I mean, you know, but, and, and, I, and I think about that. And when that, when, when Dante Wright was killed, I mean, I immediately thought, immediately thought of you and your family. Yeah. You know, what, what advice would you have if, say you're like a white kid, you're in a car with your black friend and, yet pulled over. What advice would you have like for the white friend? Like what should they be doing? And see, there you go, because what's critical is what this white friend's mentality is um, and what this white friend, how much this white friend understands about, because we've had both kinds of white friends. We've had some who were insistent on telling my son, oh no, we can do this and you can do this and because he could. And so the, the, uh, it's really critical that they really understand that there are double standards. And like I always talk about two Americas, it's real because from their frame of view of reference, it's like, oh no, but you know, it's, it's reasoned. It's like, oh, we, we're gonna do this. And I'll, I'll say this to, you don't know if that's gonna work with being in the company of somebody black. 
Right. We've also had white friends who have been with them who were cognizant of how the dynamics and stuff and oh man, you know, we happened to Hardy was in the car and got stopped another time in Florida. And mm-hmm. thank God he had a white friend driving with him and he had him riding with him because that other situation that happened previously that he described, you know, when he was stopped. Same thing, dude gr- drew his gun too. And I'll never know if that's why Hardy's alive today is because his friend was sitting next to him to maybe, you know, it's something about the presence of a white person too that can balance out. And that's a shame to even have to describe it like this, but it's true. It's like, okay, let me, you could be my front person. You cover for me. So, you know, this is how we're still, it is like we're second class citizens. It is like Dred Scott never, never changed Mm -hmm. that decision. And it's frightening. And so what you have to really know is what kind of white person you're with. Yeah. How much do they understand? Are they going to be so indignant about the law that they know works for them to get you all in trouble when they start? You know what I'm saying? So uh, it's hard I to do. Really do give a, a script about what people should do. I, I think it's impossible to do that to, you can, and then you touched on something right before you said that, Sima which brings up politics of respectability because we don't ever win. And I wrote about that in the book because I wanted to show that you can have the nice car, you can have the nice house, you can have the degrees. This is what they see. They don't see the suit, they don't see or give you credit for having achieved or attained those things lawfully or, you know, the right in their mind. They just react, they just react. And so it's impossible to prepare and to, you know, eliminate these, these things happening. I, I don't know. I had said to you back in August on that show, I hope that it was over. And it wasn't over. We had some more deaths than we had. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know. We might have some more tomorrow or today. And, and I don't some know. We won't know about this. So we won't because not everything's going to get documented. Right. right. But there's clearly something that happens about blackness, black people, what what it doesn't matter. It's the it's it's what it's almost like a a a a movie reel starts playing immediately upon sight and and it's never good. It's never good. Well you said you said and this is something that really stayed with me. You said that a lot of white people see black skin as a weapon. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that really stayed with me. And Hardy, I want to ask you because I mean, you're like you were in the NFL, and mm-hmm. and so I assume you made like a, a really good living. Did you ever have like? Because I, I hear um, sometimes like like a white person like you'll be talking about race, and a white person will say to you something like, "Oh man, well, what would you know about it? You know, you're like middle class or." Did, have you ever had that happen where people then discount what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, I've had that happen where where people have, uh, have tried to discount uh, what I was saying and um, and had it happen on the, on on the flip side where no, nah, that couldn't have happened to you. You know how how could that happen to you? I mean, you're you're this NFL player and you do this, you do that, but but what people don't realize is once you take the uniform off, so football players have this helmet on and they got all these pads on. So when you, when you come out of the uniform, you know, mo, you know, some people don't even recognize you uh, without the uniform on. Um, so, but also at the same time, um, when, you, when you walk out of the arena, you're still dealing with 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 all the all all the issues that surround race, and you're still black. You know, shoot, I walk out the stadium, I'm still black. Yeah, they don't care. They don't care how much money and, you have. Yeah, and they don't. They, you know, um, uh, some cops, some some people, some cops don't. You know, that's all they see is color. And, and I just want to add real quick too. People don't know your story by just sight. They don't know your story. I mean, no, they don't. They, they don't I, know who. They don't know who's in your family. They don't right. know, and they don't, they know, don't know. Hardy grew up in Compton. They don't know what he faced, yeah. and he has lots that he can share about what that was like being, you know, living right and going to school in Watts. Okay, and 
stuff. So it, they try to sometimes discredit you based on class. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. the real crazy thing that happens to people or happens to athletes, for instance, when they get, you know, it's almost like being initiated into this club. You know, you're, you're a world-class athlete and you've been rewarded with a contract and you can play professionally and it's, it's an honor and it's, it's wonderful. But with that comes access to, you know, upward mobility, right? I mean, sure. So you get more money, you can, you can live in nice neighborhoods, you, your kids can go to nicer schools, and then that's used against you. Yeah, because I mean, sometimes yeah. it makes but, white people more, it makes white people like more angry or, or like you have some of these white yeah, cops like, yeah, yeah, and we, that, we, you know, who do you think you are? Yeah, we've had, we've had situations. Uh, one experience was uh, we had, we had, we had uh, bought our first house and it was in a, in a it was in a, a suburban area. And um, so we move in and, and a friend of mine comes over and we're, 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 you know, of course we're excited. And he goes, hey man, let's walk around the neighborhood. I wanna see the neighborhood. So we, we go out and we start we're walking down the street and, and a neighbor called the cops <laughs> uh, on us. The cops show up, hey, uh, what are you guys doing here? I go, I live here. We, and I go, I live here. My buddy goes, yeah, you, you just bought a, bought a place down the street. Oh, are you, you sure? What's, what's the, what's the address? You know, so I get all this interrogation, you know, um, but yeah, shoot here, you work hard you try to, you, 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 you do the things that you're supposed, that you think you're supposed to do to achieve the American dream. And the moment, moment I'm walking down the street, the, the calls made to the cops like oh wait we got to get him out of here <laughs> you know what's he doing here and, and some of the sad part about it is and we lived a lot of places because of you know movement it's happened in every everywhere we've been well it sure has happened in oakland i mean i had friends in oakland you know who, um who lived like in the diamond district and up by the and one of my friends said that he no longer and he's a runner would no longer run and didn't want his kids running because a lot, you know, gentrification. So you had like white people moving in who really didn't care. You know, they're like, hey, it's my neighborhood now and you're not going to do this. And having the cops called on them and it's streets that they've ran for years. Yes. It just, it, it happens all the time. I, I wrote about it in the book, but it's happened since that. And, and we live in Oakland Hills and yes, there are, there's an influx of new, new bodies coming from wherever, I don't know they're from, but maybe they didn't get the memo, I don't know. But- or They got their own memo. Yeah, just trying to take a stroll and they're coming out like, can I help you? Um, excuse <laughs> me. And it's, it's crazy, like, you know what that is coded for. It's not, do you wanna help me? It is, well, I'm gonna see how I'm gonna approach this person to, mm, I wanna vet them. And, and we're always being vetted. Or you don't have to say a word. Sometimes it's just the stairs we get. Mm -hmm. Going down a street that is in our neighborhood, may not be our street, but it, we, it, we, we use it to get here. And new people like coming out, standing. It's almost like some John Wayne bull crap. You know, those old movies where they come out and stand in the ground and look and assess. And you just always feel like you're being reviewed. Right. And like there's some review going on about if you're gonna pass a test. And that's, that doesn't feel good. I mean, you know, it doesn't, you, you, you know, and I'm not saying everybody does this and we've got great white friends too. So it's not just one or the yeah. other, but it's far too many people doing this. And what I know is that something like that can lead to a call or can lead to some kind of interaction that doesn't go well like in minnesota or, or 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 like black people who've called the cops because something's happening and then they get arrested or they get killed yes so yes. then so then how safe do you feel calling the cops because you might get killed for calling the cops or you're black and you have like a son or somebody or a daughter or whatever who's having a mental health crisis right. and you call them for help yes and then your kid gets killed didn't that happen in Walnut Creek or Danville or somewhere out there where they yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right, because they called us about that, yeah. And they, and, right. they, and, they, and then he's dead, he's dead. Yeah. You know, so now I can't assume, I don't know that I, I may hear a prowler, but I gotta think about 
well, do I call the cops though? Cause I don't want them to, I, I want help, but I don't know. If, I don't know what's waiting with the help about perceptions and are they gonna grab the taser? And you just, you know, I mean, not grab the taser, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange feeling when, when, you do, when you call the cops. Yes. And they show up. Yes. And they're looking at you like you're the perpetrator. It's happened a lot. It's happened. Yes, it's, 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 it's happened a lot. And that's, 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 that's a strange feeling. You know, it's like, okay, now I'm getting interrogated when, when I was robbed. <laughs> yeah. There, there's some of them, not all of them, but there are some who kind of look at you like surprised when they, they see it's you opening the door. And then you got to like, so we hit, this happened one time, a long time ago, not in Oakland, but you know, we had to prove like, you know, there was this casual kind of, well, can I, can I see some ID? It was almost like, let me make sure this is your house. And like, you're not the robber and you're like doing some great acting like we've seen in a movie or something where, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you're at the door or something, but the, 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 the poor hostage in the back. That's what it right. feels like. Or, Cause you could be the white serial killer. Yeah. And go open the door and go, yes, officer. And yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. everything's okay. Meanwhile, you know, you're killing the family behind, yeah. but because you're white, yeah. nothing happens. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no, what did you think? What do you think about how now professional sports has really changed in terms of how, you know, different teams and different owners have come out and, you know, against making statements against racism and for Black Lives Matter? What's your, what, what do you think about that? I mean, I know, I, I think it's a good thing, but, you know, what's, What's your take? Uh, I, I think it's I think it's a good thing on the surface. I think uh, what 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 needs to happen is is, is a lot of follow up now. Yeah. Uh, you know, helping to uh, um, uh, implement policies, helping to helping to influence policies that are that are uh, uh, more influential towards um, you know equality. Um, you know, the biggest the big thing I, I can think of right now is is uh, voter registration, you know, and yeah. voter participation and what's going on in these various states. Um, you know, we are, we're a democracy and, and every, everybody votes, everyone's vote should count. Um, one man, one vote, right, is what we've been, we've been taught yeah. all throughout school. Um, and uh, to, to have uh, people try to reduce that uh, is is just ridiculous, and to take away take away uh, a, a, a dem democratic process. Um, I just th I just think I I'm all for you know uh, standing up, hey, uh, and and uh, you know uh, backing and protesting uh, for the right reasons, and 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 uh, and helping to implement those things that are going to help. Help our help our country, help our society, help uh, humanity. It's, I agree. Yeah, you know, you got eighty percent of your of your players are black at the minute. You know, yeah, roughly eighty percent. And so, the sensitivity about their well being and welfare has got to be there. And I think that George there. Floyd last May, put some, you know, was a catalyst of some things. But I want it to really mean something. I want it to not just be some PR, you know, opportunity to look like, you know, you know, I don't know if you, you, you saw right after all that, uh, within a month, like Campbell Soup or whoever, just everybody, we, Black Lives, and, you know, I'm not saying that they weren't genuine, but I don't see as many now. It's, what is it, April 2021 now. Maybe we'll start seeing some more. I don't know. It, it, it can't just be about PR and and opportunities to get a, a sound bite or a quote out so that yeah. you look like you're, you know, uh, supporting equality. It has to really be true. And, be true. and so yeah. your players have to feel that way. So, you know, these teams, I hope that that's what they intend to do. It can't just be some money making ploy to look good and be on the right side of history, uh, but just, you know, publicly. Well, I know years ago, um, my friends started this organization called Athletes United for Peace. I don't know if you ever heard of them. And they were involved in the Olympics, you know, when John Carlos and Tommy Smith, you know, raised their, raised their fist. And they were treated 
Like, you know, people have to realize that it, this is nothing new. It's not like, it's not. And there have been athletes throughout the years who've spoken up, but they just didn't get the support. They were called un American. Tommy Smith, John Carlos, they couldn't get jobs for a long time. Yeah. And Cap can't now. Uh, yeah, yeah that's Colin right. Kaepernick, that's right. He still can't get a job. That's no. right. You know, they give him credit, but they but they he can't get a job, but they don't want him. Doesn't yeah. make sense. And and he knelt, he took a knee for the issues that we see happening before our eyes. Um, you know, if if you know we if we just if uh you know we just take the time to to really think and analyze, you know, even just the 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 silent protest that, that Kaepernick did by by taking a knee. Man, if if you just look, sit back and analyze that and look at the history of, of policing in the country, maybe we we might be in we might be in a different place right now. Um, George Floyd doesn't get killed. You know, Dante Wright doesn't get killed. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah, like they would say, what would, how do you pronounce his name? Is it Brett Fair? How do you spell his favor? Yeah. yeah. You know, he said, they, you know, they put this thing about how he said he didn't think Chauvin was trying to kill George Floyd. And I said to myself, I don't think he was either. I think he didn't care because he didn't see him as a human being. He didn't care what happened to him. I don't think that's what he meant. But I think, yeah, because he, he didn't see him as a human being. And you know, what I think about, because I think about like police and people say defund the police or change the system or whatever. Um, but some of the people who are these cops, I mean, I understand sometimes you have some cops, okay, maybe they don't really, they're no any black people, you know, they're afraid, whatever, blah, blah. It doesn't, but, but you've got like people, I think that's why some of these people become cops. They become cops because they want to police black and poor neighborhoods, that's, they see their role as like, and I don't use this word lightly, but they see their role as like fascist, you know, stormtroopers in a way that they see their role as going in and putting communities down, you know, and occupying. And so occupying. It, all the bias training in the world is not gonna make a difference if somebody comes in and that's how they see things. I think that is what you just said is hits it on the head. And I, and I argue this till the cows come home about the bias training. And I think you do need training and there needs to be much more training. We heard some police forces only get maybe an hour of training. Yeah. But just something very minimal, right? Maybe yeah. an hour or two hours of, of bias training or per year. Some video and that's not enough. But what I will say mm -hmm. is, you know, with respect to this bias training and, and the solution. I mean, I do bias training, so I'm not, you know, I'm not putting it down. I'm right. just, you know. No, but it's not. There's something else, Emma. There is still, I don't know how you regulate someone's heart. And I think that you can give people volumes of books and everything. And if they still don't want to believe it, they will not. They will have some kind of inner argument to say, nah, I don't know, and may not do what they need to do to be, you know, what we would be consider safe, safe officers. But, you know, it, it's like, I don't know, just there's so, we keep going over this where they say, you know, you get into arguments and they become side arguments. They become little fires you have to put out over here. And it's still not the main thing about what really needs to happen. So people are arguing now, well, I don't know if he meant to, if he didn't mean, okay. I don't think the dude probably did go there and say, I'm getting ready to kill George Floyd. He didn't care. He didn't but, care. Exactly. But that not really caring and having this inner feeling of superiority, whatever it could have been. Yeah. What kills us? Because he didn't see him, because if you don't see people as a human being, right. that's when you, you kill them. You know, I've worked with a lot of cops. I've done a lot of training and diversity with, with cops. And a lot of times like, I'll have good responses because they'll say, hey, I'm not telling you you shouldn't arrest people, but would you rather arrest the right people? Yeah. I said, would you rather have relationships with the community or do you want to have like people running around who, who've committed crimes because you, you, know, you arrested the wrong person? Right. But 
but you there know, are people who it wouldn't matter, you know, it would because they that's why they can't that is why they came in. That they, they see their role and they have so much hate. Mm -hmm. And that's what and that is that they're acting out of hate. And I'm not saying everybody. No, you know, right. but but I have like an analogy for that because I, I always think about that too. And I was, you remember like right after 9-11 and I mean, that was, that shook the nation. It was terrible, but there was like a faction of young people who were not just young people who saw what they saw of the, you know, the, the Arabs or whatever they were mad at Muslim yeah. and they were going to get them. And they yeah. started seeing people enlist in the military because that's, that's what, right. I'm going to go do it. I'm going to get them. And, and that happens with policing. That happens, not everybody. Some people are in it because their grandfather was a cop. Whatever, you got that too. But that doesn't mean that you should be, the, the, with regard to selection of who is an officer, that you're the right person. Because the motive, you know, if you've got something that's got you feeling like, oh, this isn't right, and America, I want America to be like it was for me, then well, that, you're carrying that every day. I don't care if you don't get the video training or whatever. Yeah. That's how your heart is modeled. So we're dealing with that because because otherwise it it makes no sense to me how this keeps happening. Okay, and especially in Minnesota where the girl, the woman had over twenty five years of experience. Correct. So she was a vet. We we can't say oh well she was you know not you know she was new and I mean we've heard it all. But she had 25 years, she had been a supervisor, she had done all this stuff, and she can't pull out the taser, really? Pull the taser out? And why is she tasing anyway? And why is she tasing anyway? Because actually, right, when you look at it, none of that needed to happen, you know? That, but, that, but that's a good point, to always be grabbing for something to get you. Shoot you, tase you. What is that all about? What is that? Why is that? Oh, and guess what, Simma? My biggest problem is I don't see it happening to white people. Either. You know, one thing I said, you know, I was, I do a lot of writing and I was writing an article and I said, well, you know, everybody's asking, you know, talking about like black people getting arrested or getting shot. I said, and there's nobody ever answering. I said, so maybe we should change the question. And, and I, I'm, I'm not serious, but I'm a little serious as then maybe the fight should be, well, why don't we start shooting white people for the same thing? You know, demand equal shooting. Because, <laughs> I, mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I'm not co totally serious, yeah. but when you think about it, shouldn't that be like, so demand that white people get shot for the same thing? I mean, January 6th? Oh. Excuse me? I'm glad you brought that up. I was talking about this before. So I was watching an... Uh, uh, um, an interview of one of the Capitol cops, okay? He was a white man and he was telling his harrowing story of what that mob did to him, okay? Cause you know, you saw, you remember they yeah. took everything. They beat him, they knocked him down. They grabbed his taser and tased him. Now he's a cop doing all this stuff. He said he heard them saying, we ought to get his gun and kill him. I mean, they were just messing him up, okay? Yeah. He said, his, his, his statement he wanted to make was, you know, I could have shot them. I could have shot them. But I thought about their humanity and I didn't. Now he took a whooping. He took more than that, could have been killed. But he had somehow the inclination to consider these white thugs. Because he could identify, because he identifies, because like yeah. identifies with like. And if you don't know people who are not like you, then yeah. you don't have any empathy at all. But yeah. your people are like, oh. And so I it. was like, wow, well, you know, he, he is justifying why he was, he was messed up. He's hurt. He was at the hospital. He was, but he still didn't shoot him. And I know that it's possible then for that, for you not to shoot. And we don't see it, you know reverse. That is the biggest issue I have. Don't tell me about all this stuff we need to do and the tray, oh, and all this. And I see you doing it. I see you de-escalating in white community. I see you in the suburb saying, well, okay, now wait a minute. Well, just, okay, why don't you just give me a minute, get them some water, get them, whatever. But they shoot us dead. They just, re the reaction is so quick. I mean, I mean, if they keep it up, I mean, 
I don't know. Who's going to be left? I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, you know, I can't imagine, you know, what, I mean, I told my son, because I don't know, I, I think my son, when he was young, maybe he had read about, you know, Huey Newton used to carry the Constitution in his pocket yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, and quote it. Mm -hmm. So one of my son's friends, Najib, was getting stopped a lot. He had, he was big and he had long locks. Mm -hmm. um, and um, my son said, my son, I mean, my son was really young. I don't know, I don't know, maybe he's like 10 or something. And he said, well, I'm carrying the constitution in my pocket. And if I'm ever with Najib, I'm gonna pull it out and say, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, no, you're not. I said, because Najib's gonna get shot. I mean, and unfortunately, Najib later on passed away uh, last year. But, um, mm. you know, I said, your job is to witness. Your job is to witness everything that happened. I mean, unless you have to intervene physically, mm -hmm. I said, but you need to be able to report what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, on that note, when you talk about witnessing, and I think about, you know, there was some criticism that I heard you know, in the chatter, in the blogs about why didn't the, um, and I'm back to George Floyd now and all the footage of the bystanders. Why didn't they go and get the, well, who in the hell? Who they didn't know what to do also. They were scared and they were individuals. They were all individuals. All individuals. They did, and thank God they did pull out the, the phone. That young girl, that yeah, young girl. That video was huge. The body language of those cops, they were, you know, Everybody black knows, oh, you know, you're going to be dead. I mean, you want to do something, but it almost guarantees you a ticket to, you know, out of here. It, it's, it's not as easy as having this, you know, witness advocacy or I'm going to, you know, like they say it works on paper. You know, it, it, a lot of times other co cops will view you as meddling and, and then you'll get what is the booking? What what they book you under? Um, aiding? Not I don't know. There's a term interfering, interfering, interfering or something, and all this yeah. stuff. And you're really just trying to get them to stop killing people. Yeah, you, you I, really are stuck. I, well, I just got I just got a note from Hardy that he has to leave. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining thanks, us. Thanks for, having, thanks for uh, uh, allowing us to participate. This is this has been a lot of fun. So thank yeah th thank I'm I'm so glad you're able to join us. So we'll continue on now for a few minutes now. Okay. All right. Bye, See Hardy. You guys. See you later. Bye. 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 But, here. <laughs> you know, and I think a lot of it too is that you know they when they ask people who are bystanders. Well, I think one. I think I, well, most of the bystanders black. You know, they know they're going to get shot. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what I always tell people, like, white bystander, or if you're not, you know, just if you're not from, from that particular group, mm -hmm. you really consider yourself an ally, you have to practice. Because mm -hmm. what they say is that people who are bystanders, when they say, why didn't you do something? People say, I froze. Yeah. I didn't know what to do. Right. And I tell everybody, because I started practicing. I mean, I practice. I, I practice some strange scenarios. So if this happens then I'm going to do this and I'll scream or, or yell. Because if you practice in your mind, then it becomes, it becomes automatic. Yeah. But if not, people freeze. And especially if you don't know the other people around you, right. it's hard to, to take an action. Yeah. But at the same time, I think like for, especially for, for white people, I think it's very important to practice what you're going to say, what you're going to do. You know, I mean, this is going to sound crazy, but, I, but it's not crazy. Like if there's a rock, throw it in another direction to be able to just break break that tension you know to 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 break that that energy to stop what's going on i mean or even if like you, you're somewhere and you hear something racist or or if, if you're not gay lgbt and you hear some if you know in advance what you could say mm -hmm. and practice it in your head i mean people 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 are required now, and always were, but really now, to step up. 
Yeah. Um, you, it, it takes you out your comfort zone probably. And, you know, there are a lot of people, well, I don't really like to get him. It may save someone's life. It's necessary, you know, and I don't know. We'll see what happens with policing. I, you know, people were hoping the body cams are going to be the difference. What we have is sometimes they turn them off, right? Or you'll have the body cam footage and, and great. So we got footage, but then beyond that, nothing, nothing positive or, 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 or uh, fair happens. You know, I think about this case, the Chauvin case, which I'm thankful that that jury was. Yeah, I am too. It was accountability, not justice, but yeah. Accountability. But I know, I don't know if that same verdict happens in Kentucky or, I mean, I mean I'm not trying to put Kentucky on the spot, but I am thinking about Breonna Taylor and I know that they what? still have that, um, you know what I'm saying? Elijah, so, Elijah McClain. Elijah McClain. All he was I, trying to do. You know, yeah. No, that broke my heart too, you know? And he shouldn't be, there was no reason to be behaving that way toward him. And it was, you know, on the spectrum and just was sincerely trying to say, wait, oh no, oh, trying to save himself and, uh, and, and prove he was a good person and he's not here. And they don't get justice and they ain't never gonna be no justice because they're dead. I, if there's any just to view, it's that we have a system or demand a system that is such that Elijah's still walking today. That that, just yeah, that's just that's that's what I said too. It's just as if they would still be alive, that Trayvon yeah. Martin would be alive. Yes. That that the you know the mentality of like George Zimmerman or the people who killed Ahmed Arbery. Yes, yes. It's, you know, it's, it's that mindset. And I, mean, I think it's good what, that people are seeing because, you know, a lot of white people think, you know, they don't, you know, they, they didn't believe it. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I go, well, why didn't you believe it? You know, why, what stopped you from seeing it? Wh whatever it was, but now you have to see it. And then, <laughs> You have to do something. I'm worried some of that we continue to, now that they're seeing it, and, they, and there are many that are moved by what they see, um, they still somehow reduce it to an anomaly, like this kind of outlier, like, yeah, but that was, no, this can really become rampant if we don't get, you know. Well, it is. Not, you know, I mean, it could be my husband running and he and someone shooting him, like Ahmaud Arbery. Yeah. I mean, we're not that far away from those uh, uh, encounters turning yeah. that way. It's not just that people have got to start understanding these aren't just in, you know, remote incidents. Oh, well, you know, but that's, no, no. Do we see how common this is? And we still don't know everything that, that has happened. No, we, everything... we don't. We don't, because there are people who are brutalized that aren't killed and, yeah. you know, we we don't know about that you know i you know i do a lot of workshops and seminars and i'm a consultant and and i'm glad to see that in my groups now i have more white people who said that you know their eyes are being opened and and then i have to resist because there's a part of me go what do you mean right now but then i go no you know what it's just you know it's good now and now what but also bear in mind that there's stuff that you still don't know that I don't know. I'm so, you know, I consider myself pretty aware. And then, you know, and I'll find out something. Oh, oh man, you know, I had no idea. You know, I mean, I think you talked about it. Well, I, you know, I was watching, um, you know, Black, do you ever watch Blackish? Yeah, sometimes. Well, there's, there's one point I was just, what, I mean, I saw something that said, in my, Dre was talking about how he was feeling really depressed. And he said, well, I was on my way up to the mountains. And then I realized I was a Black man. He said, so I came home. And then that a shame. And I feel him because the ideal spot is to go to a mountain, right? And, 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 and take in nature and, but some can happen to you up there. And it wouldn't happen to someone white being up there. Yeah, and, so and that's the load, the heavy, the burden of always having to think about what you, your every move. 
You're so playing. when you're going on a vacation, what are the things that you think about? You know, no. what, you know, what, I guess, no so like, you know, like the people who are listening who have no idea. Yes. Tell us what so, are some of the things that you, that you have to think about? When you're talking about vacation, what first thing I do now that there's Google, because back in the day when there wasn't, I was trying to find it other ways, but I'm trying to find out the composition of black people, where I'm going. I'm Googling, is, was there any end? I mean, so I, I, this is a shame, but I'm like typing in like, I don't know, say it's, say it's, I don't know, uh, uh, Florida Keys. I, I don't yeah. know, just throw that out there. Crime, black people. I'm putting in keywords just to see, is there something, did something happen? And I found stuff too, when I do this. And like, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I'm trying to get a sense of maybe what, what has happened there, what kinds of, you know, I look at um, demographics, you know, yeah. and, and we're, all, we're only 13% of the America anyway. And that, you know, sometimes we're driven to go to places where we feel there might be more black people so that there may be less shock at us being there. I will say this, when we've gone like to the Caribbean to, to have nice vacations, it's always been problematic. We're just trying to go on the beach and stuff, but you've got, look, so when we went to Cayman Islands, for example, love it because we love water and the beach. I've never you, been, I want to go, but okay, what go. happened? That's so beautiful. Okay, but what happens is we're, we're like one, the only black family we see. And so uh, now the help was black and all the people, <laughs> the Islanders there were black and they were fine, but the, the, the other vacationers, many from britain you know so because it's a it's a, a british west indy island so they were looking at us crazy like it was turned into like 1950s you know alabama or something and you know people coming up to hardy can i get some towels this happened it it, it a property it's happened to every black person i know practically i right? need some towels and he's like well i'm sorry we we we, we don't and then they look like you're lying like Wow. And they kept asking, I, I need towels. Well, I'm sorry, I'm a vacationer. So as far as vacation goes, there hasn't been anywhere that we've gone that I haven't done some research to kind of little get, get a little peek of maybe do we want to go here or not? And, that, and is that, I mean, I know why people aren't doing that. They don't have to really worry about you know, my daughter went to Italy. She went to school there for half a year uh, under this program. And I went out there to go help her move and stuff in Milan. I was doing, I was looking to, and we had some incidents too. Crazy stuff happened. And, I, and I'm going to write about that too. But, you know, I'm sitting here and you know what it ended up being, not to take away the, the conversation in another way, but there's so much hate over there on Africans and, and that whole kind of they're taking our jobs kind of attitude about African migrants or immigrants. So they looking at you thinking you might have, you might fit that description. You fit whatever description they need you to fit is, is, is bottom, basically what happens. You know, so you have to do a lot of research to see if things are safe. That sucks <laughs> because yeah, it's not a vacation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause I don't have to do that you don't have to do that and then i spent time i would enjoying the sites but i'm always thinking about what white people's reactions and we had some we had some folks looking like they didn't want to sit by us on the train are you really in first class you know the trains and it's not like first class flying it's just different but it was the front row and yes this is our ticket they're checking our ticket kind of suspicious like like you know okay i don't think you should be here and we were, we bought our ticket. So I'm tired of having to do that internationally. Having right. to be always, you know, everywhere. It's not just America. No, because some people, well, some people think that there's no racism in other countries. Yeah, well, it's different. It can be different, but it's but there. It's, the, it's there. You know, I'm looking at the time. Um, oh, I could, yes. so, you know, I could talk to you all day. So we'll have some more shows. But I want to ask you, Number one, what what advice would you have like for a white person, say, who has black friends and you know they go driving with them? I mean, what what do you what what should white people know? Or somebody says who's not black, what should they know? 
Well, I think white people, first of all, really need to just get schooled up and read up on what has really happened and what's still happening, regardless of where they think is liberal or whatever, safe, because it may not be. I mean, it can happen in Berkeley, right? Yes, so, and it has. You know, and it has and it does. So they've got to put aside their preconceived or their convictions about what they believe is fair or just or safe and just really listen to their black friends and they'll never really know what they really go through but they really need to do their best to empathize and sit on some of this stuff they can't be you know reactionary immediately as entitled white people can be about jump into something i mean that you it just depends on the situation. It's hard for me to say what they should do. I mean, it could be a cop thing. It could be whatever with the crazy neighbor calling the cops. It's situational. But what they do need to do is just kind of stand back. And I always say hit record. Yeah. Hit record just in case. If you think something's getting ready to go down, please. Because as we see, we need we need we need a record. We, we need a record. But you know, I, I realized that I'm a little slow when it comes to like finding my camera and the record thing. <laughs> so I've been practicing. I remember you got to practice. I've been practicing yeah. hitting record, you know, finding it and hitting it real fast. Yeah. And, and hitting it in a way that sometimes that people don't see you doing it, you know, because they exactly. see you doing it. I mean, that can you got to think about this. Too. You know, we got to think about this. Too. I, I have my phone and even, you know, not necessarily just aiming to be a witness, but some stuff's been going on around and I'm trying to see if I can see who stole the package off of that, you know, yeah. but I'm fooling around with my passcode and I take so long getting Same. all that done that it's too late. So I, somehow we're going to have to figure out how to be really ready to and, be witnesses. And, and Amy, what is the name of your book and where do people buy it? Yes. Okay. So my book is How Do You See Us? And it's by Amy Nickerson and it's available on Amazon. And also Barnes and Noble carries it. Um, and I also recorded an audio version of it. I, I did it myself. So it's me cool. speaking. Um, that's on Audible. And um, it's an ebook as well. Um, so Kindle, this is what it looks like. I don't know if you can see, but it's, it's yeah. a picture. Of my family. Yeah. With, and then the glasses, through the glasses, you see us look doing horrible things. Oh, like wow. Uh, that's that's I love that. And, and now are there any like, um, well, now you had got me into Lovecraft country. So I respect oh, your, yeah. what, what are you watching now? Anything that you recommend? Okay. So love, that's right. Love I binged on that. I binged on that. I told everyone they had to watch oh, that. So now I have only gotten through the first two. So I'm still in it. Of what? So all them. Oh, I, I them. And it's on Netflix. It's really heavy. But from what I saw the first two, they were breaking down. And what's crazy about it is it's set in Compton when Compton was white. Now I told you my husband grew up in Compton. That was, at, he, his family moved in 1957 and there was white flight and all kinds of stuff. Cause George Bush used to live in, in Compton. Okay. Um, he, he did, he really did. He was one of the white occupants, but it shows that rage, that white rage of how dare you that you touched on how dare you be you know where i am and and that's i haven't gotten any further than episode two but that was enough you need to see check it out and i'm, I'm gonna start watching some more tonight it's yeah. heavy though i know i know i read about it it's heavy and and what's on your playlist anything you're listening to these days okay so you know i told you i love everything yeah me but too we've been, we've been listening to nina simone I, you know what, I've gotten back, you know, I, when things start going down, I'll go back to listening to Nina Simone. Um, I listen to Donald Burge, you know, just like, oh, yes. Yeah. I've been doing old school. Nina Simone happens to be just playing right now. I, and it's specifically Mississippi Goddamn is, is a song I can't get out of my head now. And um, I was thinking, and I know we got to go, but we need more protest music. And if I got to pick up a guitar yeah. and start shooting myself, I'm sick of hearing about money, 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 and what I'm going to do and, and beating you. We got to talk about, I mean, oh, and I also listen to Marvin Gaye too. That's been uh, helping. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and everything he said in 72 or one is what we're dealing with. 
But also, I listened to I listened I, I the Tiny Desk concert with um with uh, Common and uh, Robert Glasper. Yeah. Okay. That's really really uh, that's very you know it's very topical you know it's yeah. very topical. Um, they have this this one young woman named Mumu Fresh. She does uh like a spoken word and it's really, really? yeah it's so good. Um, yeah, it's really really good. I'll have to find I'll have to find the link. My friend Charmaine sent it to me, and then I've been sending it out, so I'll send it to you. It's it's really good. Oh, do, but uh, it's, it's, it's it's protest music time, is what it is. It is protest music time. And okay, and now how do people reach you? Okay, so I have website, uh, two websites. Uh, how do you www.howdoyouseeus.com. You can reach me through there. There's a link in there to get me messages, and also amynickerson.net. Uh, that's how you can reach me and I listen and everything I got a podcast coming out soon ain't that the truth working on it and I'll be speaking my truth I'm so glad well thank you so much I'm gonna close out and then just stay on but yes. thank you so much I just love to have you Amy Nickerson everybody the information will be on the show notes you can find out how to contact her please buy her book I read it I recommend Thank you. Enjoyed being here. Thank you.